Well, good afternoon. Thank you all for coming out on this blustery, windy, cold fall day. It's great to have so many of you here. I'm Deb Ludwig. I'm the Dean of Library Services at Fort Hay State University. And we're excited to have you here today um, because you're going to get a chance to revisit the past and also get a little glimpse of how we are preparing to unleash the future. So thank you. Um, we're going to start our program today with a, with a really exciting announcement. And I'm going to invite Jason Willoughby up to make that announcement. All right, thank you. Um, Lynn and Larry, welcome home. I know you were away for some time, but um, it's a pleasure to see you at Encore, see you here at Forsyth Library, um, see you at all the arts events in town, so we're glad to have you back. I want everybody to think about Fort Hay State as their home. This is your home, this is where whether you come back once a year or you come back every day, Hayes, Kansas is home for all of us. And Fort Hayes State University is our academic home. No one can ever replace that. And no one can ever replace Forsyth Library for us. Not everyone feels the same about libraries, but Deb, as Deb has taught me, <laughs> everyone graduates from the library, yes. no matter what you've studied. And if you frame libraries in that way, you know that we need to continue to reinvest in them. We need to invest in not just books, but libraries, professional staff that make libraries run and that guide our students to not just information, but authentic, trustable information, as I also <laughs> learned recently. <laughs> I got to go on a tour of the library with a group of donors um, on a one-day um, Forsyth extravaganza. I um, hope Deb does that every year, because if she does, um, we all have something we can learn. So the announcement today is not that I love libraries. <laughs> but he does. Uh, that's the direction I was going. <laughs> the announcement today is that Lynn and Larry love libraries, and they value libraries, and they understand the importance of what the library brings to us, to our future students, to our current students. So I'm going to invite them up to say something. But today we announce that with a very, very generous gift, they are going to be establishing the Larry and Lynn Fenwick Reading Room. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> this significant financial support from the Fenwicks will be a part of a larger, um, robust rethinking and redesign of Forsyth Library in the near future which I believe President Mason will talk about. But Larry, Lynn, would you like to join me here and say a few words? I know I was five years old or younger because my grandmother passed away when I was five. And um, prior to that time, we would go every weekend to visit my grandmother and I would be taken to the library at, uh, at St. John, Kansas, and it was over the fire station, and the floors were uneven, and it, I think a lot of the shelves, uh, volunteers had hammered together some wooden <laughs> shelves, and it probably wasn't really very nice, but the arched windows that were regular windows below and then they, you know, in a lot of older buildings, then they went up to the next floor and then the top floor had the arch on the top. And it was right here by the time it got up to the top floor. And when you're five years old or younger, you think that window is just the perfect height. Mm -hmm. And I remember the uh, first or a book that I loved so much. I was allowed to wander. I didn't get much direction with what I should read, but um, I was allowed to pick my own books. And I remember this book, uh, Raggedy Ann and Raggedy Andy and the Camel with the Wrinkled Knees. And I don't remember a lot of things back to when I was that age, but I remember that book, which later, 
my husband surprised me with a first edition <laughs> of the camel with the wrinkled knees. Um, I remember that book um, not very long ago, maybe three or four years ago, we were at a book sale and I was looking for books that they were deacquisitioning and um, I picked up this book and it was not in very good shape, but it was an illustrated children's book and I love illustrated children's books. So I opened it up and on the inside there was a picture and I had seen that picture before. It, it was something about a thousand buckets of paint. I bought it. It's in totally decrepit shape. <laughs> But it was like something went off inside of me. Now, my point is that books influence us forever. And uh, honestly, I'm not sure that a smartphone or a computer screen is ever going to do that for kids who read online. So my passion is books. Everybody knows that. Um, I hope that what we are doing will provide a place in the library to preserve those kinds of books that someone will wander in and their heart will race just a little bit faster because they have a memory of it. We were fortunate to be invited to participate last week in a, a, an interaction here at the library and we saw the need. We didn't know about this need, but last week it was definitely reinforced that there are precious books that have been accumulated, gifted, however they came to the library, but they, there is no place with the proper humidity and um, the proper lighting and um, the proper temperature to preserve so many things that the library has. And so we felt good about what we were doing, but now we feel even better. <laughs> um, so um, we're excited with everyone else. I'm the guy that gets to carry her luggage from place to place. And she, made, she made my heart flutter a while, a while back. This all started with a lady named Tammy McClellan and then John Armstrong to Mary Hammond. And lo and behold, we're asked to come back to Forsyth Library and do a little speech. Some of you may know a gentleman named Pete Hamill. Who knows that name? One, ne one hand goes up. So you're going to get to listen to about two minutes about Pete Hamill. Pete Hamill was a reporter and a columnist for, at the end, the New York Daily News. And he was recently interviewed on CBS Sunday Morning, and I just thought it was so apropos to what's going on here today. And the, the uh, person asking the question asked Pete, would you say you were poor when you grew up? And Pete's answer was, oh, we grew up poor, but we were not impoverished. So the uh, reporter says, well, what's the difference? And his answer was, the library. And he explained that if it wouldn't been for the library, I would not be alive today if it wasn't for the library. It gave me a sense that there was a world out there beyond the limits that I knew and I might be able to uh, discover. And when asked, what advice would you give young people? He said, read. You cannot write unless you can read. So, at age 84, Pete Hamill still has a library cord. He's still alive and he still goes to the library. So, Lynn and Larry are very happy to help support Fort Hayes State and this cause. We hope the reading room uh, is enjoyed by many students in the years ahead. And I will announce that Deb and Mary are coming to our house Monday, and we will be reviewing one of the donations that is not inked on paper yet. But we had a Wizard of Oz exhibit here in the library two years ago that was with the Encore series. It was a very small part of our personal collection of Oz material. The biggest part of the Oz material is about a hundred books that we've acquired over our lifetime. And one might ask, why are Larry and Lynn such Wizard of Oz people? 
It's because we lived all over the United States, and the second or third question people would ask us when we met them, oh, you're from Kansas, you must know Dorothy, <laughs> or you've seen a tornado. And so we discovered, come here, baby, we discovered that we really needed to learn more about the Wizard of Oz, and that's how we got started in the L. Frank Baum uh, family. So uh, it is our intent, the entire collection, with art and books and memorabilia, to uh, pass that on to Fort Hayes State, and specifically Fort Hayes Library. So it's good to be with you. You're quick enough to hug you, but I, I, I'm getting a hug pretty soon. And now, Dr. Mason, Dr. Tisa Mason, is, has some remarks to make for us as well. Thank you. It means so much to us, and um, I want you to know that I love books too. It took me a couple decades to even get rid of my Janet books that I didn't need anymore. And my favorite memory is on Sundays, my grandfather would pick up my sister and myself and take us to church, and if we were really good, we'd go to the drugstore and buy a book. And I was into Nancy Drew big time. But it, may, it meant so much more than that to me, the symbolism of the whole time together in our family. So I want to talk really briefly just about the role of the library. And the role of the university library plays in um, really supporting teaching and learning has never been more important than it is today. And what I love about our university library in particular and our library staff is their relentless student focus and innovative drive to ensure not only our students but our entire academic community are successful. Our librarians not only help students learn the best way to access quality information and resources, but also to use the latest technologies to enhance their learning as well. And it's something that I've really seen in this library, with this library staff in particular, come to life. This building is an incubator of curiosity and discovery. It's a hub of constant activity. And the staff here are always trying to rethink what that means and how to keep it exciting. It's a place that brings people together to share ideas, to learn and to collaborate and to create. And what else more than that could define a university? Today's university libraries are crucial stewards charged with preserving our history and our heritage for future scholars. More than 200,000 people pass through the doors of this library each and every year, and our online visitors conduct more than two million searches of our library catalog and databases each year. The Foresight Library has its feet planted firmly in our past and its vision focused on a very bright future. We are excited for the planned future renovation. We are very grateful for the Fenwicks and other donors. And that renovation is scheduled for 2022, right? meeting, Deb, make sure that it's still on the schedule for the same year. And again, we're so grateful for um, the gift from Larry and Lynn Finwick. It's a gift that will help transform and invigorate the scholarly activity that will ensure that this remains the heart of the campus. Thank you very much. I just want to say a little bit more about this generous gift from Larry and Lynn Fenwick, who not only are donors, but they're wonderful friends, and I've enjoyed so much getting to know them over the last few years. Um, this is really an important element. As, as Lynn was pointing out, we do not have the appropriate climate-controlled environment to preserve materials for the long haul, and those materials matter to us deeply. So um, we are very excited for 2022, 2023 <laughs> as well. Um, the future reading room will house, exhibit, and provide critical preservation of distinctive collections connected to Kansas and to our university. 
and while also making these materials available to researchers for study in a secure setting. On behalf of Forsyth Library and Fort Hayes State University, I'm just deeply grateful to both of you for this, this wonderful stuff. And with their help and perhaps your help, um, we will keep important history alive and inspire future generations of researchers. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you so, so very much. Thank you. I want to say thank you, Tisa, for your support, because every time I ta hold up Dana's plan and, and say, look, it's here, you're always smiling, and I appreciate your support as well. I also want to thank Mary Hammond. Mary, I've lost track. There you are, behind Brian. Um, just, you've been a great partner in this journey, and John as well, and of course, Tammy is not here today, but all three of you have worked um, together and become great friends of the library as well. I also want to recognize the fabulous Forsyth Library team. Um, they have done an amazing job, not only of putting together this event today, but a whole suite of homecoming events. And Cindy Landis, where are you? Uh, Brittany Squire, um, Andy Tinknell, Claire Nickerson. I don't see Claire. She might be moving pipes again. Beth. Claire, are you back there? OK. Um, Brian Ribbon, our Special Collections Coordinator. Crystal Hutchinson. Thank you, Crystal. Lacey Wagner. And um, Kylie, is Kylie here? Kylie is a wonderful student employee and all of our student employees who've helped pull off this event today as well. If you are from Forsyth Library or you have previously worked in Forsyth Library, <laughs> just wave your hand for a minute. You're amazing. <laughs> So now we're going to turn to um, another important donor to Forsyth Library, and I'm going to invite Brian Gribben up here to introduce this donor and uh, move on with our program. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Um, I'd like to echo Deb and Dr. Mason's thanks to the Fenwicks for this, these generous gifts that you've given us. Um, I'm going to also add to some of the comments Deb has made that these critical contributions um, towards building and creating the space isn't just to house or preserve um, or even just exhibit the unique materials that make up special collections. It also represents a nexus that scholars from this university, our students, and from beyond can come, can engage with these materials and create new knowledge maybe offering reinterpretations of existing works, or blazing a trail on their own. And this will give them the space to do so, as Deb mentioned, in a, in a safe, secured, and, and comfortable setting. So, and that kind of brings us into today's speaker, Tim Johnson. Um, Tim became affiliated with FHSU when he enrolled in the nursing program as one of the first male students. And since that time, Tim has been a steadfast supporter of the university through the Alumni Association and the Foundation. And about 2010, our relationship with Tim began when he contacted Patty Nicholas, who couldn't be here today, and said, hey, I have these outstanding materials representing historical Kansas from the territorial period into the early 20th century. Would you be interested? And of course, Patty, in her wisdom, <laughs> jumped at it. <laughs> And that began a relationship with Tim. Initially, we had documents and letters from um, early Kansas settlers, including information about the career and court martial of the Union officer, um, Thomas Bowen. Then, and it, then came the next batch, which were historical territorial maps. And that leads us into what Tim's going to talk about today these phenomenal um, real photo postcodes and photography collection that, you know, and I'll say this, Tim, your contributions and your fellowship and support have just been invaluable to us as well. So, thank you. So, Tim will go ahead and discuss his collection, some of the most recent donations made to Full Size Library Special Collections, 
share with us um, some of the more memorable uh, items um, in the slideshow and as well as towards the back you can see some reprints we made from some of the some of the really fascinating photography. Um, these are important because vernacular photography acts as kind of a snapshot, almost a text message. Um, it provides insight into the everyday civic life, culture, and commerce of the people who helped make Kansas what it is today. And so with that, I'm going to ask Tim to come up, and I will turn it over to you. Let's, let's keep it. Keep it PG, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Well, it was fun while it lasted. Well, thanks, Brian. Um, I don't know how I got started. Was postcards looking for stuff from my hometown, just as a history buff, and it kind of evolved into this photography collection over the years. And we all go through and start. What really started with the real photos. Uh, was Kodak in 1903 developed the folding camera and a paper. And with the, that was the latest technology and I've concentrated exclusively on Kansas, but there were boys and girls running all over Kansas in the 1910s and teens photographing. It's like taking out your cell phone, snapping a picture and sending it. They were going out with a Kodak, taking pictures, printing them, and sending them. So again, technology sped up, but still the same concept is there. And let's see if I can figure this out. We'll get started. I wanted this because I want to say bucking snow in public, <laughs> since I have to be PG. Uh, this is actually a woman photographer from Dorrance. Uh, these are all the 19 uh, or 1912 snowstorms. And literally, with the collection, when it all gets here, uh, we'll be able to do a thing from east to west and show what towns and all the effects. And there's also one in uh, 1913 that I've got pretty well documented. But to realize that these were done glass plate negative. But look at the detail. And I mean, and these were printed. They print, you didn't send these off to Walmart. You had to get the glass negative on, put it on the paper, expose the paper, develop the paper. So a lot of these images, there's only two or three known today. And who knows, probably a lot of these were not printed more than five times. Okay, enough of buck and snow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you thought this was comical. This <laughs> hospital, it was for the non-operative treatment of rectal diseases. <laughs> Colonics. Espen, Kansas. It was the best between Kansas City and Denver. And they did it without running water. <laughs> and does everybody know what this says? Meet me at the rabbit hunt. So we know on Octo uh, was it, what, yeah, October 17th, in 05, they were having a rabbit hunt in Chapman, Kansas. So these are the little things you can get by reading into these. And this one, I just love the photography. Smoky Hill doesn't look like that anymore, but I mean just the expanse. And you look at that, and you're just like, wow. And then this one I thought was very fascinating because it's ice harvest. I would not eat ice out of it. Kansas Creek, uh, but just the contraption they built to get it up and all the town people, probably from Halstead, went out and harvested ice. But again, with all the detail from these early photographs. This one, Polita, <laughs> sent this postcard to her father in Pittsburgh telling her that she had changed her name from, like, Betty Sue and was doing fine in New York City and assured her father that she was not married yet. But I just love this. A couple Kansas kids made it big in New York City. And then this is an interesting card. There's four of these in the collection. Uh, this happened in 1907, and I did not realize that Kansas was Prohibition then. But this happened, uh, it was an independence, yeah. They uh, confiscated two boxcars of booze, 
and were three thousand dollars. They piled it up on the corner of the courthouse, and they started to smash it one afternoon. Well, all the townspeople showed up. A lot of these, according to the newspaper, were carted off. It would be like, I'll take a cake home. And then others, they had to sample before, I love that, they had to sample them before they destroyed them to make sure it was actually boobs. <laughs> they said the aroma you could smell for two blocks, and that by the time they got done smashing, it was flowing down the streets and people were dipping cups in and drinking it. Yeah, it's like, okay, a good time by, was had by all in Independence, Kansas. Tim, colorized the picture? Okay, that was a lithograph. Oh, okay. That was a litho. Okay. Now, there are some of the uh, photos have been, the real photos have been hand-colored, okay. which, like, for fires. It's a black and white photo, and then there's the, the red from the fire in it. But, yeah, that's a printed card. This is actually a real photo. These are more of the roadside, which are up. This is just a classic example of from Kansas, and this has been published quite a bit. This is a very hard to find uh, view. This was on North Broadway in Wichita. And I grew up in a little town in Fallen in Saline County and knew Salina like the back of my hand. I never knew this existed. So I do not know how long that was there. Kansas architecture. I just thought these are great because of two different styles. But I mean, that's just a great classic photo. It's this portrait, and this is a vernacular photography. It's just, essentially, it's an art photo of a common object. Everybody knows what AHT <coughs> is, right? Anti Horse Thief Association of America. <laughs> this was an actual, by 1910, there was like 40,000 people. It was very popular in Kansas, Oklahoma, and Missouri. Uh, initially, we know the Kansas chapter started in 1859. Missouri claims that they started it first in uh, 1854. And then uh, Bentonville, Ohio, says they started it in 1853. <laughs> so we don't know. We don't know if they were interconnected or whatever. But as you can see, they were very serious. In 1894, they had an award for $100 for two horses. This was the, I love this one, that was for a membership in Salina. And initially, they referred to these guys as vigilantes. These were not vigilantes, it was a neighborhood watch group, essentially. Uh, because you see, that's not a vigilante parade. Uh, and there's several, there's also, I've got quite a few from Oxford. They had a big uh, thing there, and there's also other printed memorabilia, you know, a little ephemera, and stuff like that. Santa Fe Trail. 1920s, the Santa Fe Trail was a tourist attraction. Who would have thought? This card I love. I was so excited when I found this one. This lady, I think she was from somewhere, Ellsworth, uh, donated 15 cents to help support the markers of the Santa Fe Trail. And I think there's 105 of them. I only found like 10, so I didn't do very well. Uh, but I just love this little tourist thing. And then one of the things I found this out when I was going to Fort Hayes uh, back in the day, I could never understand with all the dust worms and stuff why ruts still exist. Farmers were using them for years to get across their pasture. And then also, there were no roads. So if you had an automobile, take the Santa Fe Trail. That's why they're still there. It was cars that put them there, not the wagons. But yeah, I'm still always looking for those. Those are hard to find. Because not very many people took photos of a tombstone. The C.W. Parker Amusement Company started in Abilene, Kansas, and went to Leavenworth and became world famous. Actually, one of the cards in the collection is from Hawaii Territory in 1907. So a Kansas-made Ferris wheel from Abilene, Kansas, was in the territory of Hawaii in 1907. So uh, there's several of these. And how I got these is happened to know a dealer who happened to get them from the 
Barnum and Bailey uh, Museum in Sarasota, Florida. So that was serendipity how I got those. It pays to be lucky. And then Brian put these up. These are printed cards, but just the graphics and uh, how much you could make <laughs> by buying a carousel. As a collector, here's just an old ticket, but obviously it's a Parker carousel. So of course, as a collector, I had to have it. <laughs> this is by the Martin Photography Company, and these photos were taken at the 101 Ranch in Oklahoma. And that is actually a, ph a photo of Geronimo. Now these were professionally done by a photography company, and I really don't know how many exist, but there is a set of 20. And these are just two of them that show in all the Indian chiefs that were in Oklahoma. They got them out there. These are the Hal Reeds. Hal Reed, we don't know, I don't know much about him, but he's out liberal. And his claim to fame is he went out while they were grazing cattle, I guess. It was, you know, open range. Went out and photographed these true cowboys. I mean, this is, it was someplace, I think, in southeast uh, Colorado. But there's a whole series of these. And that one's blown up. Uh, I think this is the one we put in the auction. And we can identify, it's like, I think this guy is that guy, you know, it's, so it's the same group. This one I bought at auction back in the 90s. There are three photos known. There is this one that's here. The Andy Brown collection at the Getty in Los Angeles has one. And I know of one that sold privately about 10 years ago. And I don't know of any others. And Tim, why are they dancing? No what else are they going to do out in the prairie? <laughs> They're obviously drinking. And we all know what drinking, I guess drinking and gambling leads to dancing. <laughs> I don't know. And this was fun because we actually know the identity of who that is. I don't remember the name. And I got to think, of, when I first got that, I thought, why are they breaking horses? They're supposed to be taking care of cattle. Oh, it's probably a trick horse. You probably know more about these than I do. <laughs> Everybody see the characters from The Wizard of Oz? It's better blown up. Because we think, well, we know there's Dorothy. I think the Scarecrow, right? We think that's the Tin Man. There is the Lion. And there is Toto. It's either, there's three dates on here. There's 1914, 1915, and 1916. So I don't really understand that. I've never researched the Scott County Land Company. But what I found this is fascinating. First, who did the display? It's a folk sculpture. You know, it was only there for three, four days. I know of one other photo of this. So I know of two photos. Uh, but yeah, I just thought that in here, in the teens, people were already relating The Wizard of Oz to Kansas. I always thought it was from the movie. <laughs> and that didn't come out till when? 1939. 30, 39. Yeah. So here, 26 years before the movie, Kansans were already identifying with the characters from The Wizard of Oz. The book came out in 1899. 1899, okay, so yeah. within 20 years. It was already. First, also, somebody in Scott County who did this had to have read The Wizard of Oz. And I was um, kind of bizarre, but then found this one, and this is from a musical that was done in 1902. But look at the characters. Have nothing to do with the movie characters. <coughs> have you seen this card before? No, neither, neither one. Well, like I said, I've seen I one other, and I actually had it, and I thought, do I need another one? And... <laughs> <laughs> but that's just, I think we're done. Oh, these are some of the other things they've done. Uh, as a folk art collector, I started collecting anything related to the Garden of Eden. 
because I couldn't buy the whole thing and move it to my backyard. So I had to have collect pictures. Hey, I'm a collector. <laughs> if there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> and then because of my nursing background, I love the Wakanga Spring stuff, and I knew the history about that, you know. And so there's quite a few great photos of uh, Wakanda Springs. And recently, a, uh, I didn't buy it, didn't get to buy it, but one of the uh, ledgers from the, those baths were 20 bucks to soak, yes, to soak in a saltwater brine bath was $20. That was back in 1908 or 1909. So that was not cheap. Not at all. Anybody have any questions? Tim, how long have you been collecting these? I started in high school. Actually, going back to uh, the Anti-Horse Thief Association, my junior in high school paper was on that. So I was collecting anti-horse thief in, when I was in high school. So what are some of the things you're still on the lookout for? <laughs> Oh, the woman photographer from Dorrance has a great interior photograph of the switchboard operator at Dorrance, and on top is this fabulous cast iron mechanical bank. I have never been able to buy one of those. The roadside, I'm missing one of the Route 66 going through the southeast corner of Kansas from Riverton. I've seen it in a collection. She wouldn't sell it to me, so I know there's one out there. <laughs> and then who knows? Who, I, it's the surprise. It's the absolute surprise. But those two are for sure on the want list, and I'll get them. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you wish you'd, you'd acquired that you said, oh, mm, No, it's no. like, I, my idea of a collector, if it's not worth overpaying for, it's not worth having. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kept me broke. But... <laughs> Go, yeah. Where'd you find the uh, photo of the stag dance? The stag dance. I bought that at an auction in a, a nationally advertised photograph auction in the in the nineties. Yeah, like I said, there's three now. Yeah, I, I I knew of the tradition, but I've never seen a photograph of it. Yeah, yeah. And this one's going up on the wall in Forsyth, so you'll be able to see it all. Fabulous. <laughs> yes. How do you tell the difference between a photo picture, like what you print, and like any other po postcards? Because you go into... The, well, the backs. Like, cool. If we could show the backs. Yeah. Uh, the back, these are, the real photos are done on actual photographic paper. And they are marked on the back. Oh. That's, that's the early way for a... Uh, but yeah, it depends on the back. Anybody else? So, you brought up a postcard that had a message from a daughter to a father. Have there been any other really interesting messages that you've read off these postcards? Oh, yes. <laughs> it's, sometimes what's on the back enhances what's on the front. Sometimes there's nothing on the back. Sometimes what's on the back has absolutely to do nothing with what's on the front. But yeah, I, I can't, one of the roadsides, I don't know if Patty put it up, is they're talking about how the hail destroyed their car someplace in Hill City or something while they're going through. And the comments, a lot of them are from the East Coast, when they're driving someplace, probably going to Colorado, driving through Kansas, some of the comments are just hysterical about what they think of Kansas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, one of them I think says, very good food, but nothing to see. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, I would invite all of you to please take some time and look at the Coolin exhibit up detailing the roadways and Route 66 as it goes through Kansas. Um, and we look forward to continued relationship with, with both Tim and, and the Fenwicks and being able to present the, the treasures to, to the university family as well as the, the general public. So I'll have Deb come back up and
<laughs> and uh, you, don't, you don't want to see me for the remainder. <laughs> so. I have nothing, nothing else to say except thank you all for being here. There are more refreshments here. We've really enjoyed sharing this day with you. There's also an exhibit of, if you haven't seen it, of George uh, Sternberg's field notes and some of the photographs that he took as well or that were taken as part of his work. So um, please enjoy and, and stay as long as you would like. Thank you.